If you will, take your Bibles and turn to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 1. Well, we'll be jumping around quite a bit. If you have a marker, put it there. We'll be coming back to this as our text over and over again through this sermon. And uh, Jeremiah will be an illustration through it. Now, Jeremiah, uh, he has a pretty rough ministry. And... Uh, in, in his lifetime, he's shackled. He, the truth is rejected. He has to write, write down everything in the prophecies in the book. The king respects it so much, he kick, cuts it up with a pen knife, throws it in the fire. Jeconiah, the first king that he's under, doesn't listen to him, and he has to rewrite it, put more. Jeremiah is against everybody. Everybody's against Jeremiah. Nobody ever listens to him. He's got basically two followers. He's got Baruch that follows him, the scribe, and an Ethiopian that helps him out of the pit. That's it. I forget what the Ethiopian's name is. Yeah, Abimelech, the Ethiopian. That's about the only two friends he's got in his entire ministry. Uh, He doesn't have any converts. They all reject what he's saying, even though it's proven time and time again that he was correct. But they never listened to him. And um, they they get upset with him. They don't want him prophesying. They throw him in prison. They throw him in a miry pit. He almost starves to death with the bread of affliction while down in the pit. They bring him out and they put him in a dungeon. He's freed but finally freed by the uh, um, general of Nebuchadnezzar's army and given a choice to either go to Babylon and stays. So he stays, and then when he stays, they still don't listen to him, and then they drag him down into Egypt, and then they get slaughtered, like he says, down in Egypt. And at the end of his life, he writes the book of Lamentations. And it's one of the saddest books in the Bible. It just he he talks about how the Lord destroyed Israel and turned against Israel and turned against his people and gave them what they deserve, and uh, and Jeremiah suffers with those who will not listen to him all through his ministry and all through his life. Of all the prophets that I read about, I would say Jeremiah probably had it the roughest as far as someone that endures through a lifetime of sorrow. His life was so bad, he had to do it by himself. Uh, He's the prophet that the Lord told him, don't marry a wife in this land. You're you're to stay seen. It's going to be so bad, you do not want to be married in this land. That's what he told Now, picking up with that thought of how rough Jeremiah's life was, I want you to pick up with Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 1. It says, Now Pasher, the son of Emar, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then Pasher smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. And it came to pass on the morrow that Pasher brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks. Then said Jeremiah unto him, The Lord hath not called thy name Pasher, but Megor Mishabib. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make thee a tear to thyself and to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies. And thine eyes shall be holden, and I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. Moreover, I will deliver the strength of this city, and all the labors thereof, and all the precious things thereof, and all the treasures of the kings of Judah, will I give into the hand of their enemies, which shall spoil them, and take them, and carry them to Babylon. 
and thou, Pasher, and all that dwell in thine house shall go into captivity, and thou shalt come to Babylon, and there thou shalt die, and shalt be buried. There thou and all thy friends to whom thou hast prophesied lies. Now verse 7, it changes the thought. There he's prophesying to Pasher, then he turns and starts talking to the Lord. He's in stocks. Pastors put him uh, in prison. Says, O Lord, thou hast deceived me. And I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. Jeremiah resigned. He's done being a prophet of the Lord. I'm not going to make mention, of, I'm not going to say anything more in the name of the Lord. But, his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. His resignation didn't last very long. Why? Because the, bur the word of the Lord was too much in his heart. For I heard the defaming of many fear on every side. Report, say they, and we will report it. All my familiars watch for my halting, saying, Peradventure, he will be enticed, and he shall prevail against him, and he shall take our revenge on him. So they wanted him to report just so they could prove that he was wrong. Verse 7, he, he changes his attitude again. He says, But the Lord is with me as a mighty terrible one. Therefore my persecutors shall stumble and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. But the Lord of hosts that triest the righteous and seeth the reins of the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them. For unto thee have I opened my cause. Sing unto the Lord, praise ye the Lord, for he hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hands of evildoers. Then he switches again. Cursed be the day in where I was born. Let not the day wherein my mother bear me be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought tidings to my father, saying, A man child is born unto thee, making him very glad. And let the, that man be as the cities which the Lord overthrew him, repentant not, and let him hear the cry in the morning and the shouting at noonday, because he slew me not from my womb. He's cursing his father because his father didn't kill him. Okay? Or that my mother might have been my grave and her womb to be always great with me. Wherefore came I forth out of the womb to see labor and sorrow that my days should be consumed with shame. Boy, you talk about up and down. Talk about every which way. This prophet's all over the place. You say, well, what's happening with Jeremiah? Jeremiah is having what is called a crisis of faith. He's having a crisis of faith. Many a times we hear somebody use the term crisis of faith. You say, what is a crisis of faith? A crisis is of faith is when the circumstances around you that you see in life makes you doubt the Lord. Some people, when they have a crisis of faith, they'll sit there and say, God's not real. And they'll become an atheist. Some of them say, living the Christian life isn't worth it. And then they just go and do whatever pleasure they want. And feel and go after the sins of the flesh. Many of Christians in the Bible, many of God's people have had, we read about crisis of faith with them. And many of them were there. I mean, Jeremiah is not the only one that has a crisis of faith. Elijah has a crisis of faith. He sits down in the Jewish church and says, just kill me, I'm no better than my father's. That's a crisis of faith. Peter has a crisis of faith. He denies the Lord three times. 
He has a crisis of faith. Uh, many men in the Bible, over and over, they have crisis of faith. I want to preach on how to come out of a crisis of faith. What will protect you from the crisis of faith? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray that You'll take and bless this message. I take, pray that You'll give us um, some understanding in Your Word that will strengthen us during hard times. We have many examples of some of Your saints has gone through hard times. And I pray that nobody will be overcome by a crisis of faith in this building. I pray that these words will help them realize the things that they need to armor their life with so they can endure as a good soldier till the day you call them home and that a crisis of faith will not happen in their life. Or when it comes, that they'll be able to bear it and they will not be shipwrecked, as the Bible says. I pray that they'll take and uh, look to you as their God. I pray that they'll trust in you no matter what comes. And I pray that they'll realize that the sorrows of this earth are natural. They're just what happens to us as believers. It's not something that's new. It's not something that just happens to us. But it's normal. And I pray that they'll be able to endure the crisis in their life that they go through. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A crisis of faith. What causes a crisis of faith? Why does a guy have a crisis of faith? Well, a crisis of faith, as we see, is uh, when things don't go the way that we think they should go. When it doesn't happen the way we think it should happen. Then someone has a crisis of faith. And there's many things that can cause a crisis of faith. I mean, I've talked to Christians who they've quit, the, quit on God, they've quit serving God, they've gone out in the world, they've lived like a devil, and I start talking to them and I find out why they did it. You know why some people will have a crisis of faith? Because they see the actions of those who they think should be spiritual. I've seen a lot of people have a crisis of faith there. Look at verse 1 in Jeremiah chapter 20. It says, Now Pasher, the son of Imar, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord. Who's the one that comes against Jeremiah, puts him in the stocks, mites him, and is the one that Jeremiah has to prophesy against? It's the high priest. It's the one that's chief governor over the house of the Lord. It's the spiritual leader that's there in Jeremiah's day. You know, many people have a crisis of faith because they're looking at spiritual leaders. And they see they're looking at the wrong spiritual leader. And the spiritual leader that they're looking at is a wicked man. You know, there's a lot of spiritual leaders that are wicked men in this day and age. There's all kinds of spiritual leaders that will cause Christians to be shipwrecked. They'll cause them to have a crisis of faith. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Ye did run well. Sometimes Christians, they'll get saved, they'll get going, they'll get going really good for the Lord, and they'll, they'll, they'll take and get going, going, then some preacher will do something, and they'll have a crisis of faith. And they'll say, if that preacher that I admired so much, respected so much, and thought of so much, did this and fell, what chance do I have? This stuff's not real. And then they depart from the faith. And they quit on God. Let me tell you, men come and men go, men rise and men fall, but only God is faithful. Only God is faithful. You can't get your eyes on man. 
If you get your eyes on man, you're going to have a crisis of faith. Number two, the next reason I see why men have a crisis of faith is when they do not see God bring about the expected result. When they do not see God bring about the expected result. Now many times a Christian will be uh, praying for something and they'll expect something. They'll have an expectation. Before they pray, they already know how the prayer is answered. And they'll say, it will be answered this way. And they have an expected result. Many will call that faith. Do we not? Do we, well, if we had faith of a mustard seed. That thought is what every one of your charismatic and prosperity gospel preachers grab a hold of and take advantage of you to make you shipwreck. Because when it comes to God... His results will be according to His will, not according to yours. And sometimes He will have mercy and answer our prayers the way we want. And what a blessing to us when He does that. And sometimes we don't see the expected result. And if a Christian is not mature in his Christianity, when he does not get that expected result, he'll become shipwrecked and he'll have a crisis of faith. Jeremiah is prophesying here and winding up in bonds and everybody turning against him and going against him was not exactly the way he saw it turning out. I guess maybe he was hoping for a great revival. And all he got was great persecution. No great revival. All he seen was everything that he warned them about ignored and then happening. Nobody getting saved. Nobody getting converted. The whole thing just burning to the ground. King's eyes getting plucked out. Zedekiah's eyes being plucked out. Zedekiah takes him in privately. What should I do? This is what you should do. If you do this, it'll be well. You know, okay, don't let anybody know you talk to me. Oh man, the king's going to listen to me. No, he doesn't. Tries to sneak out the back and run. Gets his eyes plucked out. And doesn't listen to Jeremiah. King Zedekiah doesn't. Jeconiah doesn't listen to him. Nobody listens to him. He doesn't get the expected results. You know who else has a uh, crisis of faith because he didn't get the expected results? That's why Elijah winds up under a juniper tree. He sits there and he goes out and he spends three years waiting for... uh, Was it three years or seven years before the fight? Anyways, his prophecy comes true. They test to Abraham. He shows up. He has the great victory over the prophets of Baal. He calls fire down from heaven. Man, this is going to bring about some results. The children of Israel says, The Lord, He is God. He slays the 400 priests of Baal. What's the expected results that the kingdom's going to turn around and start serving God? Instead, he gets a wanted poster on his head from the most feared individual in the kingdom. Ahab was a chump, but when his wife came after you, you were dead meat. <laughs> I mean, Jezebel says, I'll have his head. Wasn't the expected results. And he flees, and he winds up under June for a tree and says, I'm no better than my father, so let me die. Hillary, let me die. Huh? Well, yeah, Clinton's a chump. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> but, uh, but he didn't get the expected results. So Elijah has a crisis of faith. Sometimes when we don't get the expected results, that can cause a crisis of faith. 
You ever have that prayer that wasn't answered and it really shook you? You thought it was going to be answered? You ever have that time when you thought God was going to work a certain way and it didn't work that way? For a weak Christian, that's going to shake them. How come God never answers my prayer? How come God allows that to happen? They didn't get the expected result. Number three, we see the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. We see the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. Take your Bible and turn to Psalms chapter 73. Psalms chapter 73. This is why a lot of Christians wind up shipwrecked. Because they see the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. Pick up verse 1. It says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. In other words, he has a crisis of faith. Why does he have it? For I was envious of the foolish when I saw, what did he see? The prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, and their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment, their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily I have cleaned my heart in vain. Boy, many a young man has said that and gone to the devil and out into the hall. It's all vain. Man, them wicked, they have so much fun. They're doing this, God. And they have so much blessing. They prosper. They get rich. They do this. They do that. I mean, why can't I be like Joel Osteen and be a, have a billionaire's house? I couldn't act like Joel Osteen. My life depends on it. <laughs> but uh, why do they prosper? Okay. I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. God, I've done nothing but right according to your book and I've been plagued and chastened and persecuted and nothing's ever gone right. But I watch these wicked guys live like the devil out fornicating and committing adultery, playing in the bars, playing in the casinos, robbing, stealing, lying, cheating, conniving. Millionaires, businessmen, popular among the world, put in high pedestals, made presidents. All right, I better stop there. <laughs> and, you know. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say, I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. In other words, I'm going to cause my children to falter talking like this. Now look what it says. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Hey, the story ain't over yet. I found out what was going to happen to them wicked men. They're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire burning forever. 
It's good God showed them a little mercy on this earth because there will be no mercy in eternity. Man, consider I therein. What do you think happened when he was in the sanctuary? He heard the Word of God open and preached. He understood therein because of something that was said in this book. There was an understanding of this book that was revealed to him about the wicked and what their end would be. We see the righteous suffer and the wicked promise. How do we escape the crisis of faith? Well, number one, we fill ourselves with the Word of God. If you're going to escape these when these reasons come to your mind, when these things happen in your life and you're thinking like, Jeremiah, I wish I was dead. Why do the right, uh, wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? Of the question that you hear all the time, why do the righteous suffer? That's what Psalm's talking. You hear, how many of you ever heard somebody say that? How many of you ever heard say it all the time? I've heard that question all the time. Why do the righteous suffer? That, that comes up all the time. And a lot of times it's some young Christian who's having a crisis of faith. Alright. How do you escape the crisis of faith? Number one, you fill yourself with the Word of God. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9 says, Then said I, Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his Word was in mine heart as a Burning fire. You know what ruined Jeremiah from having a crisis of faith? He could not continue in his crisis of faith because he knew too much Bible. He knew too much. Man, when you know the beginning and the end and everything in between, and you know how the end results happen, you say, do you know the future preacher? Yeah, I know it pretty well. I know exactly what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen to me when I die. I know what words are going to be spoken to me when I die. I know what's going to happen to my body when I die. I know what's going to happen to this world. I know what's going to happen to the governments of this world. I know what's going to happen when I come back to this world. I know, all this. I know what the end results of your sins going to be. I know what the end results of my sins going to be. Why? Because I know I've read that book too many times. Memorized it too, too many times. I've gone into the sanctuary and understood their end. I've read the book of Job. I understand what's going behind the scenes when the crisis of faith is happening. I know what's going on in the spiritual world that you can't see when the crisis is happening. I've read too much of the book. If you want to escape a crisis of faith, you better learn the Word of God from cover to cover. You better read it. You better study it. You better memorize it. You better learn to understand it. And you'll escape the crisis of faith. His word will be a burning fire. You say, I quit, God. I'm going to go enjoy this bowl, this bar. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Look not upon the wine when it is red and take ah, nuts. I'm going to go fornicate. Adulterers and whoremongers, God will judge. Ah, nuts. I'm going to go, you know, you can't do it. The Word of God is a burning fire within you. I want to go take and enjoy the cities and the world and the lust of the world. And you walk by and there's two Sodom and walks by. Why, you wicked? I thought you didn't want to speak in my name. I thought you didn't want to preach my righteousness. I thought you wanted to keep your mouth shut. Why, why are them sodomites bothering you so much, boy? Because the Word of God is burning. You just can't help but give your opinion when you see the politics doing wickedly. Why? Because you know what's right. 
<laughs> it's a burning in your bosom. I mean, you can't keep your mouth shut. That's the problem Jeremiah had. He knew too much Bible. He knew too much Bible. There's too much of a, the Word of God inside of him. He was one from ever going out into the world and enjoying it. He was one from keeping his mouth shut for God. Been doing it too long. You want to know how to escape from a crisis of faith? Read this book about 20 times. Slowly and pay attention. You know, some people read so fast they never get anything out of it. Just take your time, read it, pay attention to what it says. By the time you read that thing 20 times, you're going to be run. You will be run. You can go out and have your crisis of faith, but it's going to be very difficult for you to do it. It'll prevent you. I see young people, they have this crisis of faith, and you know what I find common in them? They don't know the Word of God. They say, well, because this happened. You're like, well, don't you know the Bible says this, this, and this about that? It covers that step pretty easy. In many places. Why do the righteous suffer? Did you not read the book of Job? It explains it pretty clearly. Why? Okay? You may not see it on this earth, but there's something going on where God's getting glory in the spiritual realm that you don't see. Why do the righteous suffer? Well, they suffer because they're in a spiritual warfare. And Satan hasn't had his butt kicked and put down into the bombless pit yet. Okay? That's why they suffer. Okay? All right, I'm paraphrasing there. Okay? <laughs> but, uh, no, you know, they, they'll suffer. They suffer because sin is still in their life. They fill themselves with the Word of God. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. For lack of knowledge. It says, I, also will, I will also reject thee, and thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten what? The law of thy God. Why are people destroyed? Lack of knowledge in this book. That's why they go shipwrecked. That's why they have a crisis of faith. If they knew the book well enough, They'd have a hard time with the crisis of faith. Jeremiah couldn't do it. He tried. He tried to have his crisis of faith. He just couldn't do it. He couldn't pull it off. That's what you're reading in Jeremiah chapter 20. He tries to have a crisis of faith, but it just doesn't work out for him. One minute he's singing, next minute he's cursing the day he lived. Next minute he's prophesying and preaching. He's up and down. Why? Because he had too much of the Word of God inside him. Number two, you need to understand that even though things in your life are terrible, it's less than you deserve. Now once you know the Bible, you'll know this. Even though things in your life are terrible, it's less than you deserve. Take your Bible and turn to Lamentations chapter 3. Now at the end of Jeremiah's life, he reads... He writes the book of Lamentations. Lamentations is a terrible book. It's a sorrowful book. Uh, when you go through Lamentations chapter 3, you have kind of a, another chapter similar to chapter 20 where he's sorrowing about all this stuff. Then all suddenly he's praising. Then he's sorrowing. He's doing all this stuff. And uh, look at Lamentations chapter 3 and just kind of give you a little bit here. Uh, look at uh, verse 1. I am the man that hath seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He hath led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me is he turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. Saying, God's against me. Look now at verse 22. 
next paragraph here it says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fell not. I thought it was against you. No, no. He's compassionate. He's merciful. One of Jeremiah's problems, he knew too much Bible. He knew about the grace of God and the mercy of God and the compassion of God. He knew what he deserved. He knew he deserved to go to hell. And by God's grace, he wasn't. He knew that. 23, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Boy, you sure changed your tune, Jeremiah. First 20 verses, you're talking about how God's against you and how terrible He's been to you. Now you're talking about how good and merciful He is. What happened? He knew too much Bible. And he also knew about God's mercy. He knew his condition. He knew the righteousness of God. Let me tell you something. There's nothing that happens in this life that you don't deserve. You say, I don't deserve that. Yeah, you do. And a whole lot more. And a whole lot more. It's hard for us to accept that because we like to promote our own righteousness. But when it comes to a clean and holy and righteous God that knows no sin, He doesn't have to put up with any of our nonsense. It's of His mercies we are not consumed. You need to understand that even though things in your life are terrible, it's less than you deserve. You know how I have a keep from having a crisis of faith? Understand that God's mercy is on you all the time, every day. I don't want to break down like I did last week, but in the words of Simona, God is good all the time. God is good all the time. There's a lot of truth to that. There's a lot of truth to that. Why? Because God's merciful to us all the time. God's gracious to us all the time. Number three, the way to escape a crisis is in the time of your crisis... Rely on the Lord's strength and not on your own. Rely on the Lord's strength and not on your own. Come to the realization, no, you cannot get through the crisis on your own. You need to take and grab a hold of the Lord's strength. You've got to trust the Lord through the crisis. Let the Lord be your strength. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 10, For I heard the defaming of many, fear on every side, Report, they say, and we report it. All my familiars watch for my halting, say, peradventure he will be enticed, and we shall prevail against him. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore my persecutors shall stumble. They shall not prevail, and they shall be greatly ashamed. For they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. But O Lord of hosts that trieth the righteous and seeth the reins in the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I opened my cause. Sing unto the Lord, praise ye the Lord, for he hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of the evildoer. You know how to get through the moment of crisis? Realize that God's got it under control and he's going to take care of you right to the end. And it's not over until you're through the judgment seat of Christ. I didn't say it's not over until you die. I say it's not over until you're through the judgment seat of Christ. We think it's over at death when we die. Oh no. That's actually just the beginning. That's actually just the beginning. You know the Lord's going to make all things right. You didn't suffer any on this earth where for him, where he you're not going to be rewarded in eternity. The there'll be a time where Jeremiah will go through his judgment with God, and he's going to make all things right. He's going to make all them that said Jeremiah you're wrong look at Jeremiah and say, Jeremiah, you were right. We should have listened to you. He'll exalt Jeremiah, and they'll be abased. That's what the Lord does. That's what the Lord does. 
That's what He promised they'll do. The Bible promises us that the judgment seat of Christ will be judged for not only for our sins, but for our righteousness will be rewarded. It's not over. It's not over yet. Don't have a crisis of faith yet. Just write it out. See how it turns out. Last of all, if you want to get victory through the crisis of faith, pour your cause out before the Lord. Jeremiah 20, verse 12, it says, But O Lord of hosts that triest the righteous and see the reins, the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I opened my cause. Jeremiah pours his heart out to the Lord, and the Lord hears him and comforts him, talks to him. I was reading a book by Richard Rombrandt. It's called Sermons in Solitary. Now, what Richard Rombrandt, he only had so much truth that was given to him. If you read his sermons in solitary, they are doctrinal disasters. They're doctrinal disasters. The man was not doctrinally correct. He has one sermon where he says, God, the whole sermon is about God not being just while he's being racked and tortured and stuff. And his sermon is, God is not just. And he, he has a real problem with a crisis of faith while he's being tortured. Understandably so. And as he's being tortured and he writes this sermon about God being not just, he goes through and he takes and butchers the Bible saying, you're not just in this, you're not just in this, you're not right in this. And at the end of the sermon he says, God, I'll forgive you for your unjustness if you'll take him put up with me for being un- imperfect too. And that's the way his sermon ended. But he would not deny that he believed in God to them communists. But boy, was he bitter at God. And what was he having? He was having a crisis of faith. He has another sermon in that book where he talks about the crisis of faith and stuff. He recognizes that in his pain and in his sorrow that he's not really always talking that spiritual. When he's saying, what I'm doing is I'm pouring out my heart and my thoughts to God. Sometimes God has mercy on that. You might as well be honest with God because He knows the thoughts and intents of the heart anyway. You might as well be honest with Him. But one thing I do know about the Lord is the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, Thou wilt not despise. When you take your cause and you just pour it out to the Lord and cry to the Lord and say, Lord, it's more than I can handle. I'm giving it to You. He'll get you through the crisis of faith. He will get you through a crisis of faith. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. I don't know who all's watching this sermon or maybe you're having a crisis of faith with you that are here now. I know some people will see things that are terrible in their life. Some people will go through more than others have gone through. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to handle some of the things that's come across your life. And the devil's going to come in and say, it's not worth it. Give up. Quit. Why are you doing this? This is all your imagination. You're going to have a crisis of faith. I'll tell you, when that time comes, you better have been reading your Bible. Because the Word of God and the knowledge that God has installed in your heart from the Word of God is what's going to get you through that crisis of faith. You need to pour out your cause to the Lord. And you need to realize, no matter what happens in the life, this life, It's by God's mercy you're not consumed. You've received less than you deserve. And God will make it right at the judgment seat of Christ. We expect Him to make it right while we're here on this earth. That might not happen. It was never made right to Jeremiah in his lifetime. I don't ever read that it was made right. Everything he said comes to pass, but Jeremiah's life ends with the book of Lamentations. You know how that book ends? It says, we are not saved. 
It ends on a sorrowful note. It ends on a sorrowful note. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Are you having a crisis of faith? Lamentations. I want to close my invitation. Here is the last verse of Jeremiah's words. But thou hast utterly rejected us. Thou art very wroth against us. Last words that Jeremiah writes. Wow! Wow! Only one life it will soon be passed. Only what's done with, for Christ will last. You have eternity to look forward to. Don't get caught up too much on this life. You get your eyes too much on the world and on this life and on your problems, you'll have a crisis of faith. But, if you get your eyes on eternity, and in that book, you can go through no matter what the devil throws at you, by God's grace, with His power, through His might. But you have to go with the Lord. And you have to turn it over to the Lord. Got a crisis of faith going on? Well, tell the Lord about it. Turn it over to Him and trust His Word. He'll get you through it. He'll get you through it. Alright, we don't have a piano player, so I'm just going to close with prayer. Lord, I pray that You'll take in a bless this sermon. I pray that You'll take in a bless anybody that hears it. I pray that they will be strengthened in their faith and realize that, yeah, life can be pretty tough. But your word is faithful. It's true. You're faithful. You're merciful. You're kind. And in eternity, your glories will be something that we're going to shout for millions of years. And this short vapor of a life is just a moment. And I pray that in this vapor of life that we'll keep our eyes focused on You. Be the testimony for You that You deserve. And I pray that we'll bring You the honor and glory that You deserve in our life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.